for their population needs, but they still haven't got a steady supply of vaccines. The UK, of course, on the other hand, is feeling it.
Good afternoon, colleagues. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia. Yes, we My name is Julia Wanjiro Ashira. I'm a council member at uh, the Nairobi branch. Uh, today we are having uh, a mentorship program and we have uh, two important guests. And our theme is reaffirming the importance of and respect for the judiciary. Without further ado, we were supposed to start at 2 p.m. But uh, sorry, we are starting a bit late. So. We are, we are starting with opening remarks from our chair, Mr. Eric Theuri. So I'll invite Mr. Eric Theuri to do the opening remarks, kindly. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, judge. Thank you for joining us. I take this opportunity to welcome you all to this mentorship series. This is just uh, the first of many that are going to come from the branch, so watch out. We will not just be having uh, this sort of series that, are, uh, that take the form of a lecture, but we would also be trying as much as possible to try and see whether we can organize uh, uh, smaller mentorship sessions that touch on different aspects of uh, our practice. And uh, to start us off, we felt that uh, it was important to start with a topic that sometimes we often take for granted. And that is our primary duty as advocates to without fear or favor, serve justice. And as we all know that uh, the judiciary is uh, the temple at which we, we practice law. And it is therefore important that uh, that institution is given the respect that it deserves. And this respect manifests itself in various, various facets. And today we'll be looking at it broadly from the aspect of upholding the independence of the judiciary, which is a residual obligation on each and every advocate. But to also uh, look at it and say, how do we as advocates show respect to the institution of the judiciary? And as we all know, there are rules and norms of practice And so therefore it is our duty that for every time we interact with the judiciary, then we must show deference to those rules and to the procedures that govern the court. And so we have two presenters who are going to paint uh, uh, broadly uh, on those two strokes in terms of uh, reaffirming our duty to uphold the judiciary of the independence and Judge Kiage, and we all know that uh, for, the, for the past few days he's been in the limelight and I don't think we would, would have gotten a better person than him to come and speak to us and also just tell us what are some of the things that we advocates do that tend to portray an aspect of lack of respect 
to the court so that the judge would ideally be looking at the things we do as advocates that really annoy judges. And uh, we thought that that would be a, a nice way to tie it up for purposes of mentoring so that uh, we can avoid or we can be uh, uh, alive to some of the issues that we do that then tend to annoy judges and hinder uh, our uh, effectiveness in delivering justice to our clients and serving also the broader interests of justice in the community. So with those very, uh, very short remarks, I want to thank all of you for joining us and to invite you to enjoy the deliberations that are, are going to arise from the two EBO presenters that we have before you. So Julia, uh, you can uh, then introduce our first presenter, Santi Nitana. Thank you very much, Mr. Eric Seuri. Also, uh, we are going now to start with the introduction of the speakers. And I'm just going to do uh, a short introduction and reading their biography. And then uh, Mr. Eva Ogada is uh, going to be the first speaker. So Mr. Ivan Ogada is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. He specializes in constitutional and administrative law litigation. He has dealt with various cases in these areas, including representing the Law Society of Kenya in 2019 in a petition concerning the appointment of judges and two petitions concerning arbitrary arrests. He served at the Katiba Institute, one of the Kenya's largest public interest litigation organizations. Mr. Ogada is an associate editor with the Platform for Law, Justice and Society, a leading social legal publication in Kenya. He teaches public law at the University of Nairobi School of Law. He also periodically participates in civil society committees on the rule of law and international criminal law, international criminal law. So Mr. Ogada, you're so much welcome to interact with us. Karibu sana. Uh, Julia, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Ogada. Karibu. Can I be heard? Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, when the chairman called me, was it yesterday, uh, to share a platform with Justice Kiage, uh, the heat was on, uh, the intimidation was sufficient, but nonetheless, uh, we are going to try our best. Justice Kiage needs no introduction, uh, whether you appear before him as a litigator or you have conversations with him, you are certainly going to be sufficiently challenged and you have to be on your A game. Uh, we wish to thank Justice Kiage for uh, the twin roles uh, he combines on the bench. That is that of being a judge and an educator. He never stops being a teacher. Some education from him last week. Uh, I think that was the civil appeal number 12 of 2020. This is the National Land Commission versus Okiro, where he reminded us of good habits and good manners when we go to uh, the court. And that I think was edifying for me personally. Thank you very much, Judge. Now, in terms of reaffirming the importance and respect for the judiciary, I think Judge will be a better place to rationalize and demythologize the concept. I am a being in terms of speaking to the topic. But this is to the topic for purpose of four parts. I will start with introductions, uh, attempt to answer the question why judicial independence, and then we will have the way, way forward, the swan song. Uh, the magic bullet that is judicial independence resides in quasi-religious communion and concert with the concept of judicial power. 
in layman language and in simple English, judicial independence should uh, invoke in us some mythical, some energy when it's spoken about. And when we speak of judicial in independence, we should not confine it to the independence of the single judge. It should be spoken about in terms of independence for the whole branch. And that is when we speak of collective independence. When we talk of protection of independence of the judiciary, uh, it is guaranteed domestically under the constitution, Article 160, of course, and we have both international and regional mechanisms that uh, support what we have under the constitution. Additionally to what we have under Article 160, we have the following provisions that but uh, judicial independence. We have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's a policy declaration for international human rights uh, statements, which at section 10 declares that everybody is entitled to full equality and um, public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal in the determination of rights and obligations and in the course of criminal adjudication. That is section 10, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have Article 14 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. This is uh, another provision that mirrors what we have under the Universal Declaration. Uh, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights at Article 26 obligates state parties to guarantee the independence of courts in very able terms. I want to read the provision, but please look at Article 26 of the UDHR. Uh, from a policy standpoint, uh, the, the African Union In 1999, which was adopted by the first OAU Ministerial Conference on Human Rights, a meeting that was held uh, between the 12th and 16th of April in Mauritius, Grand Bay. Paragraph four of that policy document reinforces the need for judicial independence. Now, additionally to the Grand Bay Decl Declaration, the UDHR, the ICCPR, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, there are various international principles that have set standards in terms of the protection and promotion of judicial independence. Saliently standing out among these are, number one, the UN basic principles on the independence of the judiciary, the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct, the Commonwealth Latima principles of the three branches of government. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the existence of these normative frameworks, uh, there continues to be the practice. Why is this mismatch occurring? And how does the mismatch occur? For example, in terms of how it occurs, we have seen verbal insults and threats to judicial officers. We are no strangers to Jerusalem. We certainly remember some poorly crafted movie that happened sometimes last year when a lady was unleashed on the street, impregnated her and abandoned his parental responsibilities. That was poor craftsmanship intended to insult and demean this particular judicial officer. We have had orchestrated removal of procedures and these procedures sometimes do not measure the constitutional threshold. Bad habits again. We've had reprisals for judicial decisions. We shall revisit. 
when you make decisions that do not augur well with the powers that be, there's always the threat of reprisal. And this is not limited to uh, the geographical confines of Kenya. We had the late Pia and Kurunziza in uh, Burundi taking it, take it, it out against the vice president of the Constitutional Court for the reason that this judge affirmed the Constitution in refusing to append judicial affirmation to an irregular and illegal third term in office. This particular vice uh, president of the Constitutional Court was forced to go to exile. We have the example of Malawi, whereby the Chief Justice Nirenda was at, there was an attempt to unceremoniously send him on leave for the reason that he had tried to stick to constitutional neatness. So we, these are not unique to us. Another problem with the judicial independence and how judicial in this independence is slighted, we had the constant problem of poor remuneration and working condition. In this country, of course, a problem with the magistrate, magistrate cadre, and that needs to be addressed. We also have the problem of prosecution. Judges being hounded to court without due decorum and without uh, uh, respecting uh, separation of power canons. You're no strangers to Jerusalem. You watch TV, you've been seeing this around here. Unfair promotion processes. We had an interesting uh, happening in Tanzania the other week where the president by whim and fiat decided that since a court of appeal judge had written, had penned his judgment in Swahili, this man decided to promote uh, this particular ju ju uh, judicial officer willy-nilly without consultation uh, with other institutions, like for example, the Judicial Service Commission. These are some of the examples uh, how that show how uh, judicial independence has been slighted. What exactly is the problem? in terms of judicial independence and respect for the, the triad that is trias politica, separation of powers. The executive and the legislature have failed to comply with court orders again and again. The 40 judges, 41 judges question, unfortunately one nominee passed on, now 40 uh, nominees, these Orders are granted, people decide that we will not respect the Miguna Miguna example. So many court orders issued, people decide that we will not respect these orders. Political contestations. Certain cases have been uh, hot potatoes, so to speak. Uh, the Constitutional Court, for example, has been a focal point for some very heated political de decisions. And in this arena, we have had the politicians uh, bearing their foundation to undermine and uh, basically besmirch the judicial uh, branch of government. Uh, again, uh, I'll give you the history of uh, just Chief Justice Nirenda in Malawi, uh, our own revisit concept in this country, parliament slashing uh, uh, the budget of the judiciary uh, because of perceived uh, judicial interference in the realm of uh, 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 polit uh, the political sphere. The message that needs to be sent is that the constitution is an inherently political document. So that when Justice Kiage and his brothers and sisters declare this to be the constitutional position. You should not uh, be angsty. You should not be peeved at what the court has said. They are merely stating what the constitution says. So take your grime elsewhere. Don't take it out on the judges. Um, attacks on the judiciary have also been spread to deal with the support castes uh, that support the judiciary. By support castes, I mean, or uh, the support base where the judiciary usually enjoys uh, a collegial or um, brotherly understanding. 
and this I mean uh, the academia, uh, the legal profession, the civil society. And we have seen certain laws, for example, in this country, whereby laws are amended to claw back the space and freedom, the libertarian space we have with civil society. We have grotesque interference with the works of uh, the legal profession so as to undermine the traditional supporters of the judiciary. Some of these things are not innocuous. They are calculated with a broader uh, 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 intention in, in mind. And, and it's not, I'm not a surprise that the other day we had uh, a call to uh, apply for uh, some positions within the Court of Appeal and the, the, the specialist courts. You saw that those that were expected to apply were, did not uh, tender the, their, their applications for the reason that the intimidation, the abuse is intended to demoralize and stop certain good candidates from fronting uh, uh, their, their, their candidatures for certain offices. The good people will not want to be embarrassed and demeaned and soiled in the public space. So these, some of these things are calculated and we need to ask ourselves why? What is the end objective? Judicial independence is at stake. We have also had uh, instances where certain restrictive laws and some archaic laws being put in place to undermine judicial independence. We need an audit of these laws. What is it that uh, undermines judicial in independence in terms of the legislature, the products of the legisla uh, legislature? Which are these laws that undermine uh, uh, judicial independence? Quickly, next point, why judicial independence? The entrenchment of judicial independence in our constitution shelters certain key political arrangements during times of upheaval. We are undergoing a certain period, uh, we, are going and we are undergoing the period of uh, constitutional amendment right now. And the political temp tempest is bare enough for us to see. We have entrenched judicial independence so that the questions before court will be adjudicated upon we are when the independence and freedom of these judicial officers to make certain decisions are closed from the reach of political branches. Secondly, judicial independence is a constitutional uh, normative, constitutional design construct serves a prophylactic purpose. It allows for the preservation of the libertarian space by vindicating our rights and safeguarding entrenched freedoms. Without protecting the judiciary, we cannot guarantee our freedoms under the Bill of Rights. We cannot guarantee our freedom to speak, our freedom to think, our freedom to act. Judicial independence is part and parcel of our libertarian protection in terms of our freedoms to speak. Now, the Constitution, as a pre-commitment to specific rules, means against uncontrollable impulse. The judiciary, therefore, becomes the guardian in the context of constitutional restraint mechanisms. It is the buffer against what uh, we call in uh, constitutional theory, uh, the European logic. The European logic, ladies and gentlemen, is a logic of us. The prince is not bound by laws. Or in local parlance, the president is above the law. The judiciary is our guardian, our primary knight in reminding the prince that you are not above the law. Legibus is not solitus. You are under the law. We are a country of laws, not of rule by men. 
Judicial independence as a device in the cog of separation of powers equally is aimed at ensuring functional separation of powers. That is, we divide power among different uh, branches of government so that we don't have an over-concentration of power in any one arm of government. The beneficence of the functional specialization in terms of uh, separation of powers is ably articulated by James Madison in the Federalist number 51. And James Madison, the fourth president of the United States says thus, separation of powers is admitted on all hands to be essential to the preservation of liberty and is achieved by contriving the interior structure of government as that its several constituent parts may by their mutual relations be the means of keeping each other in their proper places. Uh, my chairman, Mr. Deuri, is certainly familiar with the Shang phrase that Kilam to Acheze Kwao. We are debacating the lines for each branch that the executive has, according to the Madisonian philosophy, has to respect its sphere of authority and act properly within that area, but nonetheless respect that these other branches are co-equal arms of government and they must be respected within their spheres of operation, the Madisonian philosophy. Now, Madison simply echoes what has been said by others. Uh, Montesquieu, l'esprit de loi, the spirit of laws, says that they are, must always abide as a rationale for separation of powers, the notion that one cannot abuse power. Power must check power. So in order to stop one branch from abusing power, the executive in this part of the world, in Africa, which thinks it can do as it wishes and as it feels, we have to have separation of powers. Finally, on this particular heading, judiciary are increasingly becoming separate pathways for redemption action in the democratic cog. We have an impervious political class. They will increase taxes, they will do as they wish. They will give themselves a pax as they deem fit. What is your place for succor as an innocent taxpayer who is overburdened? You go to court. The court therefore becomes a pathway, a platform to vent, to get help in the democratic cog. So those who say that the judiciary is supposed to be deemed a political, you need to think afresh. Constitutional courts, the judiciary is increasingly becoming a partisan player constitutionally in the democratic cog. The way forward, as I finalize, how do we proceed in terms of ensuring judicial independence? Courage, ladies and gentlemen. The Constitution 2010 in its supremacy is a resounding moral statement that no law, no conduct may be breached or be dishonored. It is a statement against law hitherto in place and a legal culture that did not want to be accountable and did not want to be checked. The Constitution 2010 intends to harness that old way of thinking, which was synonymous with state tyranny and an entrenched parochial system. Anyone, let alone a judicial officer, will most likely in the course of protecting the normativity of constitutional ideals encounter or run the gauntlet of these entrenched interests. And the entrenched interests that don't want to be accountable, the entrenched interests that want the old order of things to happen. 
the purveyors of tyranny will not let you rest. Therefore, for you as a lawyer, for me as a practitioner, for the judges, the judicial officer, courage. We have to be bold. In the words of Maya Angelou, Maya Angelou says that courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you cannot practice any other virtue consistently. To individual officers, individual judicial officers, I want to remind you of Digang Moseneke, uh, Deputy Chief Justice Emeritus of South Africa, when he writes uh, an ode to Ruth Fast. He says this, courage of principle requires judges to do what is and must be done within the remit of responsibilities. So just as social activists, we must take practical steps to realize our collective vision. Judges must take practical steps all this at the same time as they show absolute fidelity to the law. To those who are dithering and are spiritless, I want to remind you this, and in the words of Winston Churchill, a coward dies a thousand times before his or her death but the valiant tests of death, but only once. We need to be bold. We cannot emphasize that. In the face of adversity, only the bold shall remain standing. Another important thing in terms of ensuring judicial independence, as I wind up, we have to operationalize the judiciary fund as an existential concern under Article 153. Our financially independent judiciary will be assertive operating and regulating its affairs consistent with the letter and spirit of the constitution. As a final, finally end, I, I wish to remind us of uh, the French American philosopher, Alex de Tocqueville, who says that a society can exist only when the minds of all citizens are rallied and hold to, are held together by a certain predominant ideas. Judicial independence as an item of horizontal constitutional structuring is such a predominant idea as Tocqueville urges us to hold on to. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Evans Ogada. If we were in a physical meeting, I'd have said that uh, the participants gives you a round of applause. But now that you are online, I am the only person maybe you can just tell you thank you very much for your insights and contributions. And uh, uh, for the new partic participants, remember our topic today is reaffirming the importance of and respect for the judiciary. We had two special guests today, Mr. Ivan Sogada, who just given his insight. And uh, our next guest will be Honorable Patrick Kiage, who I will introduce shortly. But before I do so, I would want to welcome the new participants again and uh, to request that if anyone has any contribution to the topic, uh, this is a wide topic. Uh, as I have said, it's about reaffirming the importance of and respect for the judiciary. If you have any comments, any questions to the speaker and contributions, you can do so at the chat section and then we can uh, discuss them at the plenary session. So our uh, next speaker, speaker is uh, Honorable Patrick Kiage, who I have the privilege and honor to introduce. I'll just do read a small biography of uh, Honorable Kia Justice Kiage. He's a judge of the Court of Appeal of Kenya he attended the Alliance High School before attaining a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of Nairobi and a postgraduate diploma from the Kenya School of Law. He was admitted to the role of advocate in 1993. He also holds a master's degree in public service from the New York University. 
Prior to joining the bench, he was in private practice and served as a council member for the Law Society of Kenya. He taught criminal procedure and practice, as well as family law at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa and trial advocacy at the Kenya School of Law. He has published a number of scholarly articles and is the author of the textbook, The Essentials of Criminal Procedure in Kenya. So participants, uh, we have the opportunity to hear from Justice Patrick Kiyake. Karibu sana. Um, thank you very much, Julia, uh, for those kind words of introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I got out of something that I'm doing out in Mombasa, and I'm just hoping that where I am, uh, the connection is uh, strong enough to sustain this, uh, uh, this conversation. Um, I would like to thank uh, the presenter who has gone before me, my good friend, uh, Ivan Togada, um, always uh, a deep thinker. Uh, we always share articles, a, a very one-sided uh, sharing, I must add. He sent me the articles. I haven't gotten to write enough articles to send him, but I guess that's because he has more time in the academy than I do. Uh, I, I left the academy some years back, more than eight years ago, and uh, in a sense, I miss it. Uh, but I, I very kind of him to say that um, I am still holding on to that role of a teacher. Uh, but that's not really um, uh, an idiosyncrasy of mine. Uh, it's my firm belief that. Uh, uh, the Court of Appeal must always play a didactic role that because it is a teaching, it is a teaching court uh, that uh, tries to put the, the law right in accordance to how it understands it. And, uh, and so I imagine that I am not alone in trying to, uh, to point out things that need to be spoken to uh, and that uh, it is something that, uh, so help me God, I will continue to do uh, in the days to come. Uh, I, when I spoke to your chairman, Eric, and Eric, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. When I spoke to him, he, he asked me to focus more uh, on, the, on, the, on the mentorship aspect uh, of this presentation. So that, um, uh, and I'm, I'm happy that even if I don't go uh, back into, uh, though I was invited by, 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 by Evans to do so, even if I don't go back into the, into the philosophical justifications for uh, jud judicial independence, the raison d'etre for uh, the judiciary and why we must uh, you know, relate to the judiciary in a particular manner, I think that he has done some great justice in dealing with it. I, I must say though that uh, I, I got a bit, um, uh, you know, a, a little jittery when, when he said quite correctly that every time we talk about judicial independence, there's actually, it, it, it seems to set forth, uh, to use his words, it seems to set forth a, a mythical energy, uh, you know, and I was like, oh my God. So here I, there I am uh, as, as a judge, there's this mythical thing that we do, but, but there's some truth in it because you see, you, you are lawyers, I am a lawyer. Uh, and uh, we, we are citizens just like the rest of the citizens. What, what right have I uh, to sit in judgment over, over your case? What right have I to, to be at a place where I am able to say that you are right and the other person is wrong, that this is what the law ought to be? And, and I think that's really it because the business of judging, if, if, you, if you wish, is really a business that belongs that ought to belong to God and the angels, really. And so that really when someone is a judge, it is, it is a job they should, uh, they should carry with, 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 a, with a measure of, uh, if you wish, holy fear, uh, in that they are doing that which it's not really in the place of human beings uh, to do. And that really means that there has to be uh, quite a, um, a, an, 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 an awareness of, of how deep this is and what a privilege it is. Uh, let me just say this, that every, every time uh, judicial independence is under attack, every time the judiciary is under attack, every time citizens are made to believe that the judiciary is not that important after all, every time we do that, I think we, we court danger. We court very serious danger. In fact, I would call it an apocalyptic kind of danger. We are tottering right there at the edge, the edge that separates civility uh, from, uh, uh, from, if you wish, a, a place of, uh, of, of, 
of total chaos. Uh, because I think having, having an, a judiciary is the one thing that makes us move from a place where human beings decide to settle their own, uh, their, their, own um, uh, their own problems themselves, uh, which as you know, the moment everybody decides to, uh, to, 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 to engage in Lex Talion, you know, it is the claw and the tooth that, that operates, soon you'll have a nation or, or a society which is, which is blind and where life really in the name, in the, in the words of, 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 of Hobbes, the Obesian uh, state of nature, where life is, is, is nasty, it is brutish, and it is short. You just need to look at the history of this country to know that when people, when the, the, the populace lose confidence in the judiciary, when everybody decides to take the law into their own hands, then you quickly slide down the slippery slope uh, towards, towards chaos. I also want to say, indeed, that um, speaking normatively, uh, I think there is agreement all over that uh, judicial independence is, independence is key. And whether you're talking about the UN principles of, on the independence of judges, which uh, uh, was referred to, the Bangalore uh, principles, the, the Latimer House principles, et cetera, our own constitution. If you look at all that, there seems to be agreement uh, among civilized nations that there is need for an independent judiciary. The problem is that while we say so, uh, often it is a case of lip service because it seems to me that uh, judicial independence is under attack worldwide. Whether we are talking about it out in the States, uh, in, 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 in parts of Europe, uh, in huge swaths of, uh, of, um, of, of, of South America and here in Africa, the, the, the political powers that be uh, you know, are happy with the judiciary so long as the judiciary doesn't rock the boat, so long as the judiciary doesn't uh, destabilize uh, that which they consider to be important to them. Uh, but I think it's key, and that's where we as, as lawyers, you, you, you who practice law uh, in these courts, you must really uh, consider that judicial independence is something so key to yourselves, because how will you earn a living unless you know for sure that when you advise your client, that uh, yes, we can take government to court, we can take the powerful men to court, and if the law is on our side, if the right is on our side, then right shall triumph over, over might. Uh, you, it's important that you should have that kind of assurance. For you, it's a matter of life and death, literally. I mean, it's, your, it's, it's bread and butter for you. It's bread and butter. And, and so for me, uh, when, when I find that, that uh, lawyers um, do not fully appreciate why this is important. I, I think it's time to go back to basics, go back to uh, constitutional law 101 to see why it's important that you must always fight for an independent judiciary. And an independent judiciary, not just because they will not be intimidated by, uh, by, by, by government, but also because they will also ensure that there is integrity so that you know that the decision that's going to be made by the judges and the magistrates is made not because of who saw who, is not because of who it is that appeared before the particular, uh, the particular magistrate or judge, but because of the sheer force, uh, the sheer uh, persuasion, so to speak, of both the evidence and the law to which is applied a clear mind and, and, and a conscience that is, uh, that is not uh, violated or otherwise compromised. So these things are important uh, uh, to you as, uh, as, uh, as, as a profession, but also equally important to you as, as citizens. Because if we get to a point where uh, Kenyans do not trust the judiciary, and then the big, the big battles, political battles that happen in this country, you find that people will not trust uh, the judiciary enough to come to them so that we can have a regulated uh, um, atmosphere within which these things can be ventilated, then you find that um, uh, the, the social uh, structure is, in, is, is endangered. And when it does get endangered, I, I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you of the middle class uh, will be among the first losers uh, whenever that, that social equilibrium is, is disturbed. And I want to say, uh, basically, uh, before I go into specifics of, uh, of, of mentorship, I, I want to say that we must see the judiciary as an, a co-equal branch uh, of government. And, and I, it's one of those strange things that happen that um, it, it seems to me that uh, the, the executive and, uh, and, and the legislature, because they believe that they, are, they, they derive their authority directly 
from um, uh, from the people because they are elected. They think that therefore they 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 are superior to the judiciary. In my view, that's not how it ought to be. I because they they. They, they all play different, different roles, separate, distinct roles. And you cannot look at the judiciary as, uh, you know, the younger child uh, of the three or, 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 the, or, the, or the child, the bastard child of the three, so that whose, whose voice can be, uh, can, can, can be ignored. It ought not to, be, not, not to be ignored. And I think we must entrench a culture of uh, constitutionalism. So for me, I, 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 get, I get thoroughly concerned um, when you, you, find, um, uh, you, you find language that is totally intemperate being used against judges and, um, and, and, and magistrates. When, 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 when you are referred to as Wakora, for example, or when you are, you are, the question is posed, who is it that elected you, et cetera. The point is the Kenyans spoke and give unto themselves a constitution. And that constitution creates the judiciary. And the ju judicial power is actually uh, invested or in, 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 the, in the judiciary to be conducted and to be exercised in the name of, of, of the people of, of the Republic of Kenya. Um, I, I will not comment about uh, civil appeal number 12 uh, uh, that, uh, that, that was spoken about. I think that I, what, what I said, and it's not the first time I've said it, uh, regarding the need for, um, for standards of litigation and practice to be upheld is, some, is something that is, to me, it, it is so basic that it is embarrassing that I have to say it. Um, and, and I think uh, Eric and your team, and basically all of you who are on this forum right now, we must ask ourselves: What is it? Uh, what 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 is it that went wrong? Where is it that uh, the rain started beating us that we can have a situation where uh, some pleadings such as we see are, uh, are are presented before court? Much as we believe indeed in uh, freedom of expression, etc., we know that uh, uh, litigation is not a free for all. Uh, it's it's a game, uh, if you wish, that has clear rules. And, and I think those of us who decide to be in this field, we must have certain basic standards of conduct and behavior, which we must uphold at all times. And we must have a culture, really, uh, a, a culture that is able to, to, to say no uh, when people go beyond the pale. Um, uh, in fact, it's interesting to note that um, in, in other countries, uh, misconduct uh, of, of certain kinds such as we see is, is dealt with very firmly uh, by, by the bar associations. I, I am not sure that uh, uh, we, we, we do enough uh, as, as, as a legal profession to deal with those uh, so-called, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the rotten apples among, uh, among us. But I think if, if all of us be believed that look, there are standards of, of behavior, we cannot insult each other in court. We cannot insult judges and courts. If we believed that way, then, it, then you can see that we can actually, by our own conduct, by the culture we create, we can actually say those who misbehave are more uh, the lunatic fringe as opposed to uh, people who are right at the center and, and who, who, who get to, you know, it's like we, 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 we are um, applauding them when, when, when they misbehave, and I think we shouldn't do that. So uh, allow me now uh, to... To speak to what Eric was uh, was asking earlier, which is that what are the things that make judges and matches really mad? Um, I don't think that's what I want to do. Uh, uh, to say what is what is it that make make that makes judges uh, get 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 so pissed off? Uh, for me, forgive my language, but uh, le let me just say that by attempting a more positive approach to it, uh, I, I can I can I can talk about what the role uh, of, of, uh, of, of an advocate is and what we as judges expect. Because once we do that, as I talk about what we expect, then you can see what it is that we do not, uh, that we don't expect of, of, um, uh, of, of counsel. Uh, allow me, uh, and, and this really, all of this goes to respect for the judiciary really, if, it, if you think about it. Uh, allow me to first of all say, and this shouldn't surprise you, that the first duty 
and, and the first thing that we expect of, of council is, hello, assistance. More than anything else, what it is that lawyers ought to do, what counsel ought to do in court is to offer assistance. Um, you know, if you listen carefully uh, at the end of hearings, you will find judges saying, uh, thank you very much. We have given a date for this and uh, counsel, we thank you. We'd like to thank you for your, for, for your assistance. Uh, sometimes that 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 sounds almost hypocritical because there are times when you find that council actually haven't assisted you at all. Uh, council, in fact, may just have made your life more difficult sometimes. So assistance, what does that mean? Really, that is your first duty as an advocate, and that really means that you must you 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 must you must research, you must research, you must go deep, you must bring before uh, the, the the court the most recent learning the authorities on particular issues. You must keep abreast of developments in law, both locally and, and regionally and internationally. Remember, you, you cannot, remember that quote non habit, you can't pass a better title than you have. You cannot, you cannot give that which you don't have. You cannot assist the court unless you've taken the time to actually study. Uh, there are times we see to uh, this end and we look and we are like, this lawyer must just have woken up in the morning, grabbed his file, and proceeded to court. And, and that really is not, you're not doing yourself a ju uh, justice, you're not doing a service to your, to, to your client, and you definitely are not assisting the court. So uh, I would like to urge you, I would like to submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that really you must study to study, so to speak. You, you must study to, uh, to be truly learned. I mean, when we say we are learned, we really are, uh, and, and so, don't 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 keep rebutting that presumption, which really ought to be uh, an irrebuttable uh, uh, presumption and uh, uh, an irrefutable fact that you are learned. But you must really uh, get to, uh, to to study, prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, so that when you see you you come with pleadings that are that that are half baked, you have not exactly conceptualized the, the cause of action you have not conceptualized the point that you want to make you have not made a, you've not differentiated between mere argument and pleading of fact all those things show quite clearly and if if uh, if if a pleading is poor it's poor and it shows quite clearly if you haven't prepared and you make your submission before us it will show because all one needs to do is ask you a question or two and you'll be totally at sea you'll be flailing and when you look desperate it's a terrible sight there's nothing more terrible than to see an advocate who is totally at sea and unable to answer a rather simple question that that come from the bench so the first duty if you ask me is the duty of assistance so if you don't assist us you annoy us uh, and uh, not just me but you annoy uh, basically all all judges be there from the supreme court all the way down uh, to magistrates before whom you appear uh, next i'm not sure that this is this is um, a duty that you owe but this is something that i think you need to do people get really really annoyed uh, get really, really irritated when when you find that um, advocates are unable to speak audibly. Audibility, for heaven's sake! I mean, how do you become an advocate if you can't be if you can't be audible? Um, you don't have to be loud and cantankerous, but at least you need to be uh, uh, you need to be audible. Uh, it's exasperating when you find um, counsel are speaking and they are. They are looking at their files and they're looking at the papers that they have instead of you know speaking out so that the court can hear you. Let your voice carry uh, with clarity. Uh, and and often watch the judges because when you see the judges uh, you know straining to hear you, the next thing you're going to hear from a judge is someone shouting at you saying, "Counsel, we can't hear you." Now, really, if you can't be heard, how will you get to get a fair hearing? If you can't be heard, how will your client get to get a fair hearing? So audibility, in my to my to my thinking, is really really important, and uh, I think that it's important that every advocate should try to um, uh, to seriously think about um, about studying and perfecting their communication skills. Remember, when you are an advocate, really you're supposed to be the great persuader. You're supposed to be the great persuader, and you cannot persuade when you can't be heard. True, there may be a time when you may, for purpose of, of emphasis, you may, you may, you may deliberately speak sotto uh, voce, you, you know, just for purpose of emphasis. But if your voice is going to be, uh, you know, 
a scared mouse, so to speak, sorry to use that term, but if that's how you come out, uh, th then immediately you, you're unlikely to, to command uh, the, the, the confidence of, of the court and you could very easily be dismissed even though you had a good case. Next, let me speak to something that um, uh, I, I, find, I find quite, 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 quite irritating and I think I've said so in a few judgments of my own, uh, and, and that is where, where, where advocates just forget the need for brevity. Brevity, brevity for sure is the soul of wit. And um, long windedness is not exactly uh, a big thing. It's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not a plus for you. Uh, in fact, I suspect not even God likes long, long prayers or long submissions. Uh, and, and if you think I'm just being uh, uh, irreverent here, remember uh, Jesus himself said, when you pray, you know, don't be like the Pharisees who come and pompously beat their, you know, look up into the sky and, 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 and say all manner of pompous stuff. That's not how you, how you, how you make your point. Uh, he gives the example of the guy who came in and simply looked up. He couldn't even look up. He beat his chest in uh, more in sorrow and said, have mercy upon me. Uh, a sinner, uh, just a few words, and 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 he says that was more effective, a more effective prayer than the long-winded one that talked about how the great things they are done, their tithing, and 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 and, and their many accomplishments. I, I think it's important that you you need to um, capture your case as briefly as possible. Cut off any verbiage that is not necessary. Uh, if you look at uh, the Court of Appeal rules, for example. It tells you if you want to put together grounds of appeal, you need to be concise. You need to be concise as to, as to exactly where you think the judge went wrong. And it says clearly, you need to avoid argument and narration in your pleadings. But you'll get shocked at the length to which some uh, practitioners go in terms of their, their, their pleadings. Right now, I'm dealing with a, a judgment. I, did, I don't take that long to write judgment, but I, I have worked on this file, and, and I kid you not, I've worked on it for a month. And with each of those months, each, each, each passing day, I get more and more annoyed. Why? Because the, the petition before the High Court was extremely long. The supporting affidavit, I think, ran into 150 paragraphs together with numerous annexures, most of which were totally irrelevant. And when you come to the, the you know, a supplementary affidavit, a reply to a reply affidavit, so to speak, you find someone has written an affidavit that is 30 typed pages running into 131 paragraphs. A reply, really, how can you do that? I mean, you, 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 I don't think it's, 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 it's a good thing to torture those who are going to read that which you write. So be brief. Be to the point. Uh, I brevity, again, I repeat, is the soul uh, of wheat. Some of my colleagues on the bench are, 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 are a lot more uh, patient than I am. Uh, so they would say something like, uh, you know, let us, give, let us give counsel an opportunity to exhaust themselves. The answer I quote we are in chambers discussing is, is look, counsel have a right to to, to exhaust themselves, but they don't have a right to exhaust me. So please don't exhaust judges with what you say. Keep it really brief. In the court of appeal, expect you'll be told that you're going to speak in five minutes, you know, because you put in your submissions. What is it that you want us to go home thinking about? What is it that you think is so critical? It must be hard or else you might lose your case. So let us be brief. Uh, next. Uh, my, my brother there has spoken about the need for boldness and courage, and I think this is key. I think that advocates need to be bold. Um, remember that as an advocate, you speak for the voiceless, you are champions of the downtrodden, the vilified, the unpopular, and the disfavored. And because of that, you need to be, uh, to have a certain kind of metal in you. You need to, to have a certain kind of character. You need to have a certain kind of, of internal constitution, both mental and, uh, and, and if you wish, emotional, that enables you to be able to stand up and be on the side of that guy that everyone else wants to be hung in the morning. So it's important that uh, you, you approach uh, the oath of, that you took, the oath to, uh, to uphold the law and to pursue justice, because it was a solemn uh, vow that you took and you are priests at the temple 
of justice. Therefore, do not be afraid of might, but rather confront it uh, with right. Uh, and whatever you do, do, show some passion, some courage in that which you, you are doing. Now, you may uh, indeed face uh, some judicial officers that may be a little intimidating, uh, but, but if you know that you've done your homework well, and if you know that there is a, there is a plausible argument that you can make, uh, go ahead and make it. Again, I have in judgments uh, actually acknowledged courage where you find that a matter may look hopeless even to us judges at the beginning, but uh, when an advocate who knows what he's talking about insists on making their case, you find that it's very easy to sway uh, the judges so long as they're able to see uh, where it is that you, that you are going. So don't consider a matter lost unless you know for sure that the law is not on your side, but be, that be willing to be bold and to make your case. Next, let me talk about, uh, oh, and, and of course, when you, if you're not bold, if you look all intimidated, if you look like you are lily livered and yellow and, 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 and yellow on the inside, uh, the judges will see that you're a scared person. If you are totally young and new, you are making your maiden appearance, chances are judges, especially judges of senior judges will probably uh, you know, be very solicitous of you. They, they will try to, to guide you all along, to lead you along. But if you appear before us a few times, you practice for a few years, and then you come to court looking all scared uh, and it will show your voice will not be as confident as it ought to be. Uh, your voice will start uh, you know, fading off. Uh, you probably break, break into a sweat. You're holding onto a piece of paper and it will be shaking. Uh, you know, All that shows. And when you are scared, you can't hide it. And when people know that you're scared, even your opponent can smell blood and they will come for you. And if there's a bully on the bench, God forbid, they will come very much at you. So you need to show some kind of courage. Even if you're dying on the inside, on the outside, do have uh, a measure and, and a show of, uh, of, of sufficient courage. Uh, let me talk about uh, courtesy and civility. Uh, this, I think, is really, really, really key. And unfortunately, uh, in recent times, we have seen courtesy and civility go down the drain, go out the window in the manner in which um, advocates treat each other and in the manner in which advocates address the court and in the manner in which uh, generally their really? attitude is. Um, I, I think that it's a really sad, sad day when you see advocates exchanging uh, words to a point where they've lost their tempers, uh, they've lost their temper at each other, uh, they are shouting at each other, they are insulting each other, both in writing, pleadings where people are described in very un unsavory terms, I'm sure you've seen them doing the rounds, uh, with, with respect, really, you cannot do that if you are an advocate. Um, it, it doesn't matter that, you are, that your colleague seems to behave like he's not learned. Even if he's not learned, please call him your learned friend. It, it's important that you do. If you must disagree with him, even if he's, he's speaking hogwash, don't call it hogwash. There, there are better terms. Uh, you know, euphemism that, euphemisms that we were taught uh, back in school. Use a euphemism. There, there are acceptable ways in which you can disagree with your colleague without getting all personal and without losing your temper. Uh, someone has said, and I used to say this when I, when I used to teach trial advocacy, I used to say that, um, that, that uh, st st simulated, forensically simulated emotion is okay. If it is a simulation that you want to show that you are outraged and it is a simulation, that is okay because you want to hit your target, you know what you're talking about. But to be, to be, to be actually stimulated into anger is another thing altogether because you need to be in control uh, of, 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 of yourself. Um, when I hear uh, that uh, advocates have uh, tried to intimidate uh, uh, judicial officers telling them, oh, we're going to send you to the Judicial Service Commission. There's going to be another vetting. There's going to be this and that. I'm, I'm like, really? I mean, the point is, first of all, we, we, are, we are of you. Uh, we, we are advocates uh, in our own right. We, so that really, it, it, it's really unseemly totally when you find uh, uh, advocates uh, addressing the court in a way that is meant to try and intimidate them or tell them, you know, you, I'm going to upstairs right now, I'm going to the court of appeal right now, and I'm for sure, I am going to, uh, I am going to have you reversed. You don't have to say that. Just go ahead and have it reversed at the court of appeal. You don't have to tell the judge uh, or, or, or the magistrate that you're going to have their decision um, 
uh, over time. It's enough simply remember what you say. When, when they rule in your favor, you say, most grateful, Your Honor, most grateful, you, my, my Lord, um, uh, you know, most obliged. When you don't like what they say, really all you need to say is simply say very well, my Lord. Just say very well. If you say very well, it's me, it's me really you are telling me, I, I, I think you, what you said is correct. I will accept it because you are the judge. So you don't have to call it what it is. Just say very well, and that's good enough. So it's important, I, I think, that um, we, we, we maintain civility among ourselves. Some things are really very simple. When you get to court, try and find out who's on the other side. When the time comes, you don't have a junior standing up to, to introduce himself and introduce nobody else, or to try and introduce their seniors, unless expressly they have been asked by the senior to introduce them. But ideally that shouldn't happen. It is the senior who stands up and introduces the others. And, and, and you must know how to, how to address the court with, you know, with the kind of respect and decorum. Remember, it's not really for, uh, it's not so much for the, the particular individual. You may not like that particular judge or magistrate, but you must respect uh, the office and you are an officer of that court, not an officer of that particular uh, judicial, judicial officer. Um, if I may move on, um, there's need for creativity sometimes. Um, not sometimes, I think all the time. Um, I, I see often parties who, and advocates who just, uh, they, they, they want to file a particular kind of application, they immediately ask their seniors or their colleagues to give them a precedent and they take the precedent, they don't even think twice about it, they don't think through it, and then they, they, they frame their, question, their, their, their pleadings and their submissions uh, in the manner that they have seen elsewhere. I think it's important that you take time uh, to, to be creative. Remember that as an advocate, you, are, you need to make your appearance before court memorable. You need to make it such an appearance that when you leave, the judges or the matches are left saying, wow, that was quite an appearance. Uh, and they look forward to, uh, to seeing you again. You've seen that, uh, uh, you know, the, the writing somewhere, someone says, uh, everybody who visits this place uh, brings joy. Some when they come in and some when they leave. Let it be that you bring joy to the court when you get in and not when you leave because you've been so uh, so, uh, so so boring. I, I mean, I think with respect that uh, it, it's, 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 um, uh, uh, it's a contradiction in terms uh, for, for, for lawyers to be boring. We are supposed to be the most interesting, most creative characters around. And, and I think remember that, I think you need to remember that uh, we, we listen to so many cases sometimes. I, I mean, I pity trial court trial court judges and, and magistrates who have to hear the same kind of thing over and over and over again. So the, the difference will actually be in who is it that appears? How do they make that presentation? Make it brief, but make it memorable. And that there really needs uh, for you to, uh, it really needs that you need to be quite creative there. So eloquence, if you ask me, eloquence that is uh, married to law and substance goes a very, very long way. It really leaves a very good uh, uh, impression. And talking about creativity, I, I need to say that you need also in terms of, uh, think about lawyering at the peripheries. You know, there are areas of law that are yet to be explored in this country. Um, long before I became a judge and the new constitution was coming in, I, I, I kept thinking, man, this is gonna be an, a, a good opportunity to actually push uh, the, 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 the frontiers of law, push the boundaries as far as you can go. But I, I find it very problematic that there's so much that hasn't been done yet we haven't developed enough in the area of social and economic rights. We haven't done enough yet. We know that this is an area that requires judicial pronouncement. Lawyers haven't done enough. Uh, we haven't done enough in terms of environmental law at all. Because uh, if you look at the Land and Environment Code, it was actually created to be a land and environment code. But the truth of the matter is, I think 99% of the cases that are filed uh, before that court are actually land cases. And, and so what happened to the environment? What happened to the whole idea of generational equity? So that we must ensure that we who are here today are making use of the resources that we have in a way that ensures that those who come after us, our children and our children, our children's children and our grandchildren will actually get opportunity to also have a viable um, uh, world to inherit. I think we lawyers could do so much more, but we haven't. Let me tell you about an example of, of, uh, of uh, an example of uh, creativity. Those of you, uh, Swahili, I know is a challenge to, to many lawyers, which is a shame, but uh, if you got to get a copy of the statement by the Tanzania Law Society uh, the other day, 
uh, you, you will have seen how lawyers can step into the gap because the statement they gave in Swahili is the kind of statement that was being given by our Minister of, uh, of, of Health in terms of what you need to do to protect yourself from coronavirus and so on and so on. So lawyers stepped in uh, to become, if you wish, uh, social engineers, which is what they, are, they ought to be, health engineers almost, because they saw a gap that needs to be addressed. So lawyers, I think we need to be very, very, uh, very, very uh, proactive and very creative. There's much that we can do uh, to make this world a better place. Uh, let me go back to something that I think goes back to civility and courtesy I mentioned about, and that is discipline. It's important that we must all respect the authority of the court. I have, I have, been, uh, I, I have been horrified sometimes when I see uh, uh, lawyers being the ones who sometimes disobey court orders or who counsel and encourage their, their clients to disobey court orders. I think that is really a big shame and it's something that we must make every effort to really, really be as far as away from as possible. Perish the thought that um, we could ever advise our clients to do anything that is against the law or that seems to undermine um, uh, that uh, and, and undermines uh, the authority of the court. So part of that uh, discipline is, uh, remember there is uh, the court process and there is, is a public thing and, and, and we must ensure that we obey or obey the rules. Uh, how do we dress when we appear before court? Um, I mean, I think we still need to maintain our sober colors um, and uh, we must also be sober ourselves. I, I know of times when we have seen lawyers coming to court and you can tell clearly that they have, um, they, they, they have imbibed uh, some spirit as liquors. Uh, they are not exactly uh, th themselves, they are quite drunk. Uh, remember, you are called to the bar, not to the bars in town. Uh, and so it's important that uh, when you come to court, you, uh, you, you maintain that, uh, that, that, that discipline. Uh, because when you come and you, and, 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 and you are all, uh, so to speak, washed up, uh, you cause us to pity your client because you probably are doing your, your client a great uh, disservice in the manner in which you're presenting uh, the case. So don't look uh, confused and helpless before court because when you do that, uh, it's quite obvious that the fees you obtained were probably obtained by false pretenses that you'll do a good case and 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 you did not. Next, let me speak to uh, I I integrity. You know, integrity really is all that you have. Uh, we say the the profession of law is 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 the no, is a noble profession. Uh, once upon a time, and I would like to believe that, that ought to be the case even now. Uh, an advocate's word was always his bond. If uh, you speak to an advocate who is on the other side and you agree that, look, uh, give me 20 days uh, to see if we can settle this matter. Uh, if not, then I will file my defense. But instead of doing that, uh, you find that, uh, you know, <laughs> instead of giving you time, someone applies for a default judgment or judgment has been obtained. And then you speak and say, give me about 30 days. Give me a stay for 30 days. I try and see if my client can organize the check. Uh, 10 days down the line, long before the 30 days that you were given uh, come near exp expiration, you find that auctioneers have been sent uh, to your, your, clients, uh, uh, your clients' premises and, and, and you know how they behave, the goons. And, and, and then you must wonder, if the advocate gave his word, how is it, how is it that the word is broken uh, with, 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 with as much, with, with, and the, the one who does it doesn't even feel any shame and doesn't even have a prick of conscience. I, I think we must, as a profession, always ensure that our word is good. Um, so that when you, you come to court and you say, um, uh, sorry, I'm not able to come uh, this afternoon or to come tomorrow uh, because, did I disappear? Um, I'm not able to come today or tomorrow. Am I back? Yes. yes I'm not able to come today or, or tomorrow because, um, because I have a particular difficulty. If you are known to be one who speaks the truth, then the courts will be more than happy to indulge you when you have a difficulty. But if on the other hand, you are one who is known to be a habitual liar. First of all, I mean, you can see the contradiction there that there should be an advocate who is a habitual liar. It's bad enough to lie ever, 
but to be a habitual liar. But if you're not to be a habitual liar, then you find that your the the, uh, the the court will take whatever you say, no matter how honest may be, with a pinch of salt. I have seen, shock on me. I have seen uh, in in town, right there in the in the city of Nairobi, CBD. I have seen advocates at around 11:30 uh, taking a walk in the streets of Nairobi when you find that they had sent an advocate early in the morning to hold their brief at nine o'clock to say that uh, I'm sorry, Mr. So and so is not available today because he is out in uh, uh, out in Kehancha burying his, uh, his, 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 his auntie. So how is it that you are supposed to be in Kehancha unless I'm seeing a ghost that you actually are walking in the streets of Nairobi? Uh, so, and small, small things which really uh, are, are beneath us as advocate, but judges do take note. Magistrates do take note. There are times when you find an advocate making a very strong argument in court saying this is the law and citing an authority, but because they do not, they haven't created um, a reputation of honesty, you find that judges will take that with a pinch of salt. They'll go and ask their researchers, can you please, I, have give, I was given this authority, but please, can you go and confirm whether these pages are, for, are, are correct? Is there anything missing? Can you tell us whether that particular decision has been, um, has been overturned on appeal or things like those? Why? Because they know that certain advocates are basically liars. And it's a terrible reputation to have. Your integrity is key. Uh, and, 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 and it's something that I think you need to, you, you need to, to treasure and you need to jealously, jealously guard. And I will not say too, too much uh, more about, um, uh, uh, about, about that. Of course, there are things you should never ever do. Don't ever bribe or attempt to bribe a judge, a clerk, uh, uh, a court assistant, uh, or, or anybody. Uh, don't seek improper favors. We, we judges don't come from, from Mars. We, I mean, we, we are part and parcel of this society. We, we were with you, we practiced law with you. Uh, so don't use, the, don't take advantage of the fact that we go to the same church, for example, to try and make an improper approach or expertise communication, because that's really, really embarrassing. Because if you do, I will have to tell you off, uh, and that will, you know, that will go around, that, that will go and it will, in, it will interfere with our friendship. Let us maintain our friendship, but, you know, stick to your lanes. Uh, let everyone take care of, of their business. I mean, I, I know, uh, when I when I did my master's in New York years back, I I, I worked with an advocate, and I was very surprised that on on an evening, you know, the advocate would be he used to he used to love jazz. He would be doing his thing, and there would be judges that he appeared before who were there taking drinks with him and so on. And there was no there was no big deal because everyone knew that no one is going to try and use that kind of association to try and get himself a favor out of the judge. So those are things that you need to bear in mind, and they speak to uh, they speak to your integrity. Uh, as as I come to an end, uh, le let me speak to uh, professional social responsibility. Um, as, as an advocate, you are among the highly favored members of society. Uh, you, you belong to that, that top, the cream de la creme, so to speak. And, and you, you've been given opportunities, you've been given uh, favors that, that the rest of society don't have. Um, I think that whenever the Law Society organizes, uh, um, uh, what do you call them? Something weeks, uh, legal awareness weeks and so on, I, I think that lawyers ought to really be going into that a lot. I, I don't know whether the Law Society um, gives points, specific points for, uh, for professional uh, social responsibility, for pro bono work and, and so on. But I think you need all of us as lawyers, all of you as lawyers in my view, take a case somewhere, take a case and do it as part of your giving back to society. It does make a big difference. They say that lawyers are totally heartless. I don't think we are heartless, far from it. We shouldn't be heartless. We can be, we can be quite uh, thorough. We can be quite uh, you know, devastating in what we do, but we are human beings and we have a heart. And uh, there are causes, I think, to which we can commit ourselves. We can give the, the practice, uh, we can give the, our, our learning of law uh, you know, as a gift to society to try and help out where we could help out. Finally, because I'm sure you'll have uh, questions to ask and so on, uh, let, me, let, let, me, let me end where I started. Uh, and which is that you need to make it a point to protect judicial independence. That's number 10 of my points. You need to make it a point 
to protect judicial independence because it is a guarantor of rights. It is the upholder of justice and the rule of law. So it is really for you advocates to speak up uh, for and on behalf of judges and the judiciary. When we get vilified, when we get uh, demonized, when we get attacked, I mean, I, I cannot call a, call, a call a press conference to defend myself or to defend the judiciary, I shouldn't. But you, as, take, as important stakeholders, you, you, you can play that role of educating society about what it is that happens. That when a judge rules in the manner that he has done, when judges decide things in a particular manner, it doesn't mean that they necessarily hold those views. But if that's where the law leads, if that's where the evidence leads, they have no choice but to declare it as it is. So, um, you, you know, avoid, uh, engage, you know, engage with the judiciary as much as you can. Of course, I'm not saying don't criticize judges. Please do, by all means do. But I think criticize in a manner that is objective and constructive. I have had situations where, oh, I've seen it <laughs> even on, 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 on social media. Even my own ruling and the other judgments we come across, ah, you find that you guys, and, and, and you say the judge got it all wrong. This is a stupid ruling. This is, you know, and I'm like, really? And you are, you are, you are advocates, criticize us all right, but do so in a way that is respectful, do it in a way that is constructive, write journal articles and, 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 and you know, weigh our jurisprudence, tell us where we are wanting and we'll read that and we can improve uh, as and when we, we, are able, we are able to do that. Uh, so please don't, don't vilify and condemn uh, the judiciary wholesale and uh, uh, intemperately. Uh, as I said earlier on, not too long ago, as I quoted in, in an application for review that was brought before us, uh, I quoted someone who said that, you know, don't burn down the courthouse when you lose a case. The fact that you lost a case doesn't mean that you, you that necessarily the judge, the judge is incompetent or the judge has been compromised and so on. The point is, there, there are always two sides to, to, uh, uh, to, to a particular argument. And often I can tell you for free that judges agonize a lot. They take time to really debate the merits of, of, of either side or both sides of the case before deciding on where they do. Sometimes we don't even have unanimity. Uh, that's why we have dissenting judgments, etc. But if you see our dissents, our dissents are always, always very respectful. We don't attack each other in, 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 in our dissents uh, because we don't have to engage in polemics. And we don't have to uh, uh, engage in, in insults. That that that's not that's not really what what we need. And 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 finally, um, don't go around suing judges just because they ruled against you. Uh, there's a case I think not too long ago. Uh, uh, we decided Bellevue uh, somebody versus uh, uh, judges Gikonyo and and, and Karaoke. Uh, and, and we were like, really, how can an advocate decide to sue judges just because they ruled in the manner that they did? First of all, we are immun we are immunized. Uh, you know, so long as we are acting in good faith, uh, we have judicial independence, all those things are there. But I need to make a point. Judicial independence does not mean judicial impunity. So if, if we step totally out of, the, out of line, obviously there are mechanisms for dealing with judges and magistrates who misbehave. But I think as long as judges are acting in good faith, they are trying their best to do that which they can in accordance with the lights that they have. I think it's only fair that you give them that opportunity and 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 you be the ones to support us uh, so that we can do that which we do uh, because um, sometimes the job can be quite thankless uh, and, uh, and 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 so have, have have a moment spare a moment if you wish uh, for the judges and much to try so hard uh, to do the right thing and it's you who can support us and not ourselves uh, we can't speak out there in our own behalf. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. I hope that uh, you found that useful. Well, oh, thank you very much, Justice Patrick Kiage. Allow me to give you a round of applause on behalf of the 80, 78 members who are now online listening to you. Remember, we started off this program with our speakers today who have been uh, my learned friend, Mr. Evans Ogada, and now uh, Justice uh, Patrick Kiage, who've just uh, given us his good insights. Allow me to tell you that I have personally benefited from the insights that you've given and this mentorship. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, allow me to recognize the presence of uh, most of, uh, we, we are 87, we were 87 participants, 78 participants. Allow me to recognize 
the presence of our chair who had uh, given his opening remarks, Mr. Eric Theory, and uh, our council members, I can see Munene Warochere is in, uh, and other council members who've just joined in. Joined in. And uh, also our, my senior learned colleague, Mr. Peter Wanyama, Simba and Simba Advocate, Linda Nzioka, thank you very much for joining in. As I had uh, indicated before we started, if you have any questions or uh, comments which you feel that should be discussed right now, we have around 10 minutes. We, were, we started off at two, uh, some minutes past two. We have uh, 10 to 15 minutes where we can uh, have a little discussion. So if you have any contribution that you need to air, you can raise your hand and I will allow you to do that. I can, uh, in the meantime, read some several questions. I have, I think I have two questions. One is uh, directed to Mr. Ogada and it is from Eric Theuri. If I can read out, Mr. Ogada, how does one remain bold in the face of disagreement with a judicial officer in the course of handling a case by remaining respectful? Maybe Ms. Ogada, you can handle that. Um, Julia, now that you started the path of recognition, I think I saw Mwalimu uh, Ana uh, Konuche online. I also saw the Honorable Salem Lorot online. We do recognize you, thank you very much. Um, how do you remain respectful uh, yet bold? Um, uh, tough one, it's an individual choice. Huh? Uh, what I normally do uh, as a person in court, um, number one, get to know the politics of the court. Um, uh, right now I'm appearing before uh, five judge bench. Uh, did I disappear? Can you hear me? Yes. Proceed, I'm saying, Ogada, we can hear you clearly. Um, I'm appearing before five judge bench and I have purposed to understand the psychology and the thinking uh, uh, with these individual judges. The temperament is also important. Uh, we have a, a couple of judicial officers who have different temperaments. So I'll not push my arguments with these particular officers and I'll choose my words carefully. If I don't need to speak, I'll do my speaking in writing. So it's, a, it's an individual call. Um, what I normally will not do is argue a lot in court. If a decision has been made, I have this particular decision. Thank you. Allow me to read out another comment, maybe from uh, my senior, Mr. Miss Ann Konuche, who uh, so recognized, who has joined us. Thank you very much, um, Ann Konuche. Uh, she commented and said, "Remember, you are called to the bar, and not the bars in town." That is a quote of the day, actually. And uh, thank you very much for that quote, uh, Honorable Patrick Yage. And uh, this is another question from Mr. Gichuki Waigua who asked, in these times of virtual communications, should our dress code change, perhaps slightly? That is uh, no ties. Maybe, uh, Honorable Justice Kiage, you could uh, guide us on the same, kindly. Um, th th thank you. <laughs> the, the question of dress code is, uh, is, is an interesting one. Um, today, I mentioned to you at the beginning that I'm in Mombasa. The other thing I do is that I'm, I'm the chairman of Sharia Sako. Uh, so I'm attending a, a, a leaders convention of, in, the, in the Sako movement here in Mombasa. But as I came down, I mean, I would have been more than happy to, to do my, my court cases like this, you know, the way I am, right? Uh, but uh, believe you me, I actually carried my chamber jacket. I carried my white coat shirt and the bib, so that I have actually, I've actually been dressing up in my hotel room so as to uh, to hear uh, cases. Uh, so I had cases on, on Tuesday, that yesterday, and today as well, um, virtually. I think that there is, 
there's merit in, in maintaining what we maintain. Because there's a way in which you can start going down the slippery slope. When you say uh, you can dress uh, informally, then things start going south a little. Uh, people will come with their, they've come from jogging, so they come with us, they, they are, you know, they are, they, are, they are jogging stuff. Some, some are, I, I have been told, I didn't see it, but I'm told there was actually uh, an occasion where I'm told cancer actually appeared while in bed. Uh, I think it was all over the place, yeah? Cancer is in bed and, and, and is appearing before court. Now we can't allow that. I, I think the best way to ensure that we maintain this is, at least for the court of appeal, formal dress for the court of appeal, and we're about to tell this to counsel, formal dress for the court of appeal means just dress up if in your office or wherever it is you are, just dress up as if you are in court and let's carry on with it. The other courts where you just appear in suits still appear uh, in suits. Of course, there's a whole big argument whether there is any particular value in our people dressing in ties, their cravats, so to speak, and other things, which really don't belong to us. They're not even Kenyan, they're not Af African, but that's an argument for another day. Before that happens, I think the law society standards for dress code are, are still apply, even if we are dealing in the virtual in the virtual world. Of course, you need to avoid, uh, you need to be, there's discipline that goes with the virtual appearance. We know that. You must be muted. You must ensure that you are, your camera is off, especially if you want to engage in other activities. It's important that you, you know that you're in court. That's all I'm saying. I think that's well answered. Uh, I cannot uh, see any other member who wants maybe to contribute or uh, to ask any Oh, I can see a question by Ms. Violet Kabuga. My question is geared to ju Judge Patrick, Justice Patrick Kiyage. I'm yet to commence my ATP training training soon, and my end goal in my career is to be a magistrate. What are the requirements, both academically or professionally? I was inspired by Magistrate Zainab Abdallah during my judicial attachment while undertaking my LLB, and you have been a judge. Uh, uh, is an inspiration to me. I think uh, maybe uh, Justice Kiyage uh, can be able to read out this one. Uh, Yes, I've read that. Yeah. Um, I, I think Violet is yet to commence uh, ATP training soon, so she has quite a bit to go yet. Uh, what I would say is uh, focus on, uh, on, on your ATP, uh, work really hard on it, make sure you pass uh, preferably or at, your first, at your first attempt. Uh, and once you've done that, uh, it may be a good idea if when it comes to, to pupillage, I know that pupillage now uh, the courts actually give op opportunity uh, for for uh, for for ATP students to 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 do their pupilage um, at the courts. That may be a choice to take. Um, but I, after after you are done, depending on what level it is that uh, the Judicial Service Commission wants to employ magistrates at, uh, they will be. You must do at least two years, I believe, at least two years uh, of of experience as an advocate before you can. Uh, you, you can be entitled to apply, but the, the terms will come out uh, as and when there, there is an advertisement. But in the meantime, all the best, Violet. Thank you, Violet, for joining in. This is a mentorship forum. Uh, it's meant for advocates and also uh, persons preparing to be advocates. You're most welcome, of course. Uh, I have another question from uh, Quiton Ochieng. Let me just scroll up and see. Uh, Sorry, I can't. Uh, be, uh, let me just read out this one from Nancy first. What should one expect from the court in a situation where opposing counsel uses demeaning language and is otherwise disrespectful to their counterparts? I think you had talked about that, Justice Kiage, but maybe you could give a quick comment on the same. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, I think as an advocate, um, you, you must not let the bad conduct of your colleague, um, first of all, intimidate you into silence. And you must also uh, not be tempted to descend to the level at which they are. But when counsel is misbehaving, that is the time when you as counsel on the other side ought to alert to the, you need to alert uh, the magistrate. Of course the magistrate or the judge will be noting what is happening, but you probably need to actually formally indicate uh, that uh, counsel is, uh, is, is out of order, 
council is uh, uh, approaching on, uh, on, 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 on contempt and ask the court to put its foot down uh, to, to contain the, to contain the, the, the particular uh, council. I, I believe from where I sit myself that sometimes judicial officers are to blame uh, for lawyers getting out of hand. Because the moment a lawyer starts misbehaving, the final authority of the court of the court is actually the judge or or uh, or magistrate. They ought to be able to rein in uh, that advocate. If the advocate proceeds, goes on with with open misconduct and open defiance, that probably is actually uh, contempt in fasciculia. It is contempt in the face of the court, and there is power uh, in every judicial officer to punish that advocate in that, in that particular, uh, you know, right there instantly. Of course, it's a power that is exercised very, very, very sparingly. And I don't want a situation where every time uh, a lawyer says things that a judge doesn't like, they are sent into, into to the cells. That shouldn't be it. But also you can see times where conduct is so egregious, it's so wrong that it will be wrong for a judge or magistrate not to take action because by not taking action, you are undermining the authority of the court. Thank you very much, Justice Kage, for you, your answers. And uh, as we wind up, I would want to read one question from Quiton, Quiton Ocheng, where you have lot of, lots of issues to address or point to, or a point to make, for instance, in written submissions. How do you ensure your pleadings or submissions are concise, but at the same time addressing all the issues or points? I think uh, this now boils down now to issues of a, uh, of, uh, how to address court. Maybe it could come from a person in the bar, Mr. Ugada, you can answer that. Mm, submissions, I, uh, I always identify issues to be addressed. I read my opponent's uh, pleadings, my own try to reduce them into not more than three questions that the court needs to address then I will try as much as possible to answer those issues in order to articulate my own position. Um, keep it short. Uh, Justice Kiage, uh, I interacted with Justice Kiage and the Court of Appeal a while back when I was doing my pupillage. I was one of the first to do the pup my pupillage at the Court of Appeal. And uh, what was honed into my head was that keep it short, keep it brief. So I want to keep it short but make sure that my list of authorities uh, are more elaborate in terms of explanation, in terms of what I, I want to say. So keep it short in terms of submissions, list of authorities articulates my position. Thank you. Okay, we are coming to the end of this mentorship forum. It has been great to hear from uh, our guests uh, who've already now spoken to us. Uh, people are commenting at the comment section uh, Violet Kabuga says, uh, thank you so much, Justice Kiage, for the response. Uh, Salem Rorot says, thank you, Mr. Ivan Sogada and Honorable Honor Justice Patrick Kiage for your illuminating presentations. Uh, remember, this is a Nairobi, LSK Nairobi branch mentorship programs, which uh, I run. And we always have these mentorship pro programs monthly. Check out our, our Facebook pages and uh, online so that you can be able to know when we are having these sessions. They are very informative and very important for us as our advocates and colleagues to participate in. So I want to wind up this uh, uh, program. Uh, maybe I could uh, wind it up with a word of prayer. Could request uh, our senior, Ms. Ms. Ann Konuche, to just say a word as we wind up. Kindly, if Ms. Konuche can hear me, you can say hi to the people and bless us as we go. All right, I can hear you. <laughs> thank you, thank you for acknowledging me and also thanks to the judge. That was a very pleasant presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you to Mwalimu Evans also. Uh, let us pray. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for the afternoon that we've had we want to give thank you for the gift of life we want to thank you for our professional lives and we pray that whatever we have learned whatever we have gained through this discussion lord we shall put it to use and it shall be to our gain and to your glory in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen.
How about good afternoon, everyone? Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thank you. You too. Thank, Thank you, Julia. Bye.